Well, first of all, I want to thank Richard for setting everything up so beautifully for my visit. And to everyone here at JU for how welcome you made me feel. I mean, I feel like I have this new family now. Everyone here has been so wonderful. And I'll tell you, I didn't know much about JU when I first got uh, the notice that I would be receiving this wonderful award. And everything more I've learned about it has made me like this place better. And you all have a fabulous community here terrific students, really dedicated to that, and I really dedicated to that. I've heard what you're teaching on so for you, so I know how much work you all do on behalf of these students, and it's really terrific. So in trying to figure out what to talk to you about today, I thought this is a Marine Pioneer Award. And pioneer, to me, has the connotation of going someplace where no one's ever been before and seeing things for the first time. So that's why I thought, why don't I talk about ocean exploration and how much the exploration of the oceans has changed since I was starting out um, as an oceanographer back in uh, graduate school. So um, the first dimension of ocean exploration I want to talk about is just exploring in space. And I think that is what most people have in mind when they think of exploration. Lewis and Clark going out into the Northwest Territories and finding things for the first time. And certainly when I started as an oceanographer, exploration in space was the main way that people were looking at the ocean. Um, it was uh, certainly a time when um, you could look at a map of the oceans and see places that were the size of Montana that had no ship tracks to them. Basically, no one had ever gone there before. And so there were many places in the ocean that still needed to be explored. Um, so one of the, the first um, uh, papers of any significance I wrote was on this phenomenon called the South Pacific Super Swell. And uh, this came about through exploration in space. And when I was a graduate student, I looked around and I said, well, there are a lot of places in the ocean that need exploration. There's the Arctic, there's the Antarctic, and there's also French Polynesia. So, Someone has to explore French Polynesia. <laughs> Why not me? Why not? I mean, I'm, I'm not an old weather person. I grew up in Minnesota. I had enough of cold weather. French Polynesia was the place I wanted to go. And it turns out that there had been these reports that the seafloor in French Polynesia was unusually shallow. This was in the days right after the quantification of the depth age curve for ocean uh, crust, that basically you could predict how deep it should be based on its age and vice versa. You could guess its age based on how deep it is because uh, all seafloor starts out shallow when it's created at the mid-ocean ridges and as it moves away from the mid-ocean ridges, it cools and contracts and subsides, except for French Polynesia. Everything there was way too shallow for the known age of the seafloor. So I went out there to figure it out. And um, one thing I had to do was, of course, rule out the idea that the seafloor was shallow just because the crust was there. If you go to some place like um, the Sierra Nevada Mountains, you know that the mountains are higher because they have deep roots beneath them that sort of buoy them up like a, an iceberg. And so we had to rule out the fact that the idea that this was shallow seafloor because there's so many volcanoes there, they had just produced excess oceanic crust, and so that's why it was shallow. So most of the work I did in French Polynesia was to image the earth beneath the seafloor. And this involved um, uh, going out with hydrophones and arrays and ocean nautilus seismometers, putting using sound sources, either explosives or um, air guns, to put energy deep into the ocean 
and um, those energy waves would um, turn deep inside the Earth, come back to the surface, and from their travel times, you could measure how thick the crust was. So we definitely showed that the crust was not thicker. So the sea floor was not shallower because of that. So instead, what we concluded was that it was shallow. In fact, well, I'm missing a whole bunch of steps, but we brought together all sorts of different data. And what we figured out in the end, and it's sort of on the back of all these t-shirts, that the reason why French Polynesia is so shallow is that it is basically the interior of the Earth's stovepipe. It's where all the heat comes up. And it's because around the edges of the Pacific, so um, you know, here in the trenches of um, Tonga Kermadec and uh, in the um, uh, Northwest Pacific and the Aleutian Arch and the Japanese Trench, basically these plates are moving down into the to the Earth's mantle, but they've been at the surface for 100 million years, so they're cold and they cool the mantle. They all dip away from the center of the Pacific, so the only place for the heat to come up is in French Polynesia. And by taking expeditions to the North Pacific, we found evidence that this had been the Earth's stovepipe for more than 100 million years because there was evidence that the seafloor now up here in the Northwest Pacific, if you rotate it back to where it was down here when um, all of the volcanoes up there formed, it was shallow at that time too. So this was a, a, a big thing to see that required exploring the ocean on scales of thousands of kilometers. Um, so that's um, one dimension of ocean exploration. But as I moved on in my career, I realized that exploring the ocean in space was ignoring the fact that the oceans changed in time as well. And so there were other dimensions that needed to be um, explored. And of course, with um, looking at things on scales of hundreds of millions of years, it doesn't matter whether you were out there last month or today, it's already the same. But for many other problems in the oceans, it really does matter when you were there. If you want to catch an event as it's happening, or see long-term changes due to climate change, due to fishing, whatever, stressors in the ocean. So um, then I moved on to exploration in time. And I'm just going to give you one example of what was learned through exploration in time. And these are two cutaways of the Grand Canyon in Colorado and the Monterey Canyon, which is offshore Monterey, California. And what's common about these two is, you know, the Grand Canyon has the Colorado River that carved it. And it was pretty easy for scientists to understand why that canyon's there. Basically, the Colorado Plateau was being lifted up, and the erosive effect of the water simply eroded the canyon down through the strata. That explanation doesn't work for Monterey. Although there's a river at the mouth of the canyon, the Salinas River, the Salinas River only runs a couple months of the year, only during the winter or wet season. And the main problem with it is the Salinas River is fresh water, and the ocean is salt water. So when the fresh water hits the ocean, it floats on the top. It's not going to carve a canyon at the bottom because it's too light. The water's too light. And so the question was, how do you get something like the Monterey Canyon? And if you look around the US, there are canyons everywhere. All of them have a river on the, um, the head of them, but none of those rivers can actually cause a canyon. So um, we decided at, uh, as I was at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute at the time, that we needed to understand this. And this work was led by um, a scientist named Charlie Paul, who was actually very creative. And he came up with a way to instrument the canyon with current profilers, with uh, turbidity meters to look at um, uh, sediment coming down the canyon, all sorts of instruments that would figure out what are the flows in the canyon, 
How fast are they? Where's the water coming from? What's the chemistry of the water? Is it salt water? What is it? And uh, so he put all these instruments out. We probably spent, I'm saying, pretty close to a million dollars putting these instruments out. And we put them out during the dry season, when the Salinas River wasn't running, just so we could see, uh, go back and make sure that all the instruments were working and getting data. So uh, the ships and the um, remotely operated vehicles went out, they put all this equipment out, went back in two weeks to see how everything was doing. There was nothing there. Everything had disappeared. And in fact, by circling around and watching, they finally found the equipment in a massive jungle of um, anchors and um, <coughs> instrument housings and um, uh, 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 cables and things, 200 yards down the canyon. Total mess, complete loss of everything. And that was during the dry season. So whatever big forces were um, involved in that canyon, they happened during the dry season too. So we went back to the drawing board, we got even better equipment, stronger equipment, tougher equipment, and of course, more expensive equipment, and it went out again. Finally, we found stuff that was strong enough to withstand these events. And what we learned was actually pretty interesting. It's um, shown in this diagram here. Basically, these candy car carving events happen every two weeks on the fortnightly tide. And what happens is, along shore currents pick up sand, and they travel this way here, and they travel this way here, and that sand encounters the head of the canyon, and it drops into it. So these are actually transporting sand that falls into the top of the canyon. Finally, it builds up past its angle of repose, and when the tide triggers it, it races down the canyon like a sand avalanche. And if any of you have ever seen an avalanche, the, the forces are incredible. So these sand avalanches happen every two weeks, and this was an active process going on the whole time. And here, there have been oceanographic institutions in this area for years. The problem of what cars, undersea canyons, was actually the first problem in marine geology ever posed by Shepard, who wrote the first book on marine geology, and it took 100 years to solve the problem. But it was the beauty of being able to explore in time with that equipment that allowed um, this uh, problem to be solved. So next I want to talk about exploration by remote sensing. So in one case, we went out and explored in space, another time with time, with stationary instruments, but you can also explore the oceans for space. I, I tell people this as to cheer them up for people who get back from their first oceanographic expedition and say, I was seasick the entire time. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, you can be an oceanographer without actually going to sea. You can just use remote sensing data from space. And um, this is sort of a, a backpedaling in time, because it goes back to when I was a graduate student, and I was just about to graduate. And a physical oceanographer walked up to me, and he said, did you know that a satellite that was sent out to measure ocean currents is so precise that it actually has sensed the topography on the seafloor? I thought it was crazy. And then I looked into it, and he was right. So basically, the idea for this satellite was called um, CSAT, and this is its follow-on, um, Topex Poseidon, is that when you have a major current like the Gulf Stream, it actually raises the level of the ocean. So that by measuring precise variations in um, ocean elevation, you can look at the strength 
in the position and how they change in time of major currents like the Gulf Stream or the Kuroshiro in Japan and other ones like that. So these physical oceanographers who basically had all the money, mm -hmm. we, you know, geoscientists had no money, but they had all this money to put the satellite up. They were hoping to measure these currents. <laughs> what they found was that the signal was totally drowned out by the gravitational effect of variations in the seafloor. So if you have a big volcano on the seafloor, what essentially happened is it gravitationally attracts the ocean. So the ocean bounds up over a seamount. If you've got a seamount that's two kilometers high, it's just a matter of a few centimeters. But this instrument was so precise that it could see variations in sea level from space that were only a few centimeters in height. <laughs> so um, this led to um, one of my early papers here on how to predict the behavior <coughs> of the seafloor from space using this satellite altimetric data. Now, at the time, we had better maps of the moon than we had of the seafloor. And this was the first time to massively map all of the seafloor from space. And um, we, we did the, 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 my contribution to this was I didn't do the data processing, but I did the mathematics. How would you actually convert a bump on, on sea level to what the seafloor looks like? And so um, the analysis was basically here where there was a sweet spot um, in uh, a scale between about 16 and 160 kilometers where you could recover um, bathymetric height, of the, the topography of the seafloor from space. At shorter wavelengths, um, you needed to actually go out with a ship and sonar to do it. At longer wavelengths, there was no signal in the data. So you couldn't tell the difference between um, an abyssal plane that was um, four kilometers deep and an abyssal plane five kilometers deep. They had no signal in the um, seafloor elevation. But this was the um, uh, main uh, sweet spot. So what you can see here is a series of maps that show the contribution from this kind of analysis. So up here was um, the best map of French Polynesia area that existed um, right before I started uh, graduate school. Then this was a better map that came out just as I finished graduate school. And um, this map um, had more ship tracks and more data in it. So it's got, you can see, more detail than the earlier map. <coughs> this is what the seafloor looks like after the analysis of the satellite altimetry. And you can see without adding a single other ship track, all the uh, volcanoes and all of the faults in the seafloor that are better defined uh, because of that. And um, this shows the ship soundings today in that area, in this area, but it's superimposed on a map of the US so you can see what the scale is here. So as you can see, the ship tracks are pretty sparse, and you would never be able to um, uh, resolve any features in these big gaps between them, you know, North Carolina or uh, Saskatchewan, um, if it weren't for the satellite altimetry. What I'm going to show you next is um, an expedition I took out to the area, and we were doing a ship cruise right along this line. And um, I had analyzed the satellite data ahead of time. And one curiosity was apparent. There had been a feature called Favored Bank that was first appeared on the map of Captain Cook. And he was the first person to measure depth of the seafloor in the area. And Favored Bank, he had put prominently on this map because he said it's shallow and it's a navigation hazard. If you run into it, you will ground the ship. But because it wasn't above sea level, it was hard to see. But when I looked at the satellite data, where Favored Bank was, there was nothing. Flat seafloor, nothing, nothing uh, that came up near the surface, no features at all. But 100 kilometers 
further to the west, there was this big feature in the satellite data that was on no maps. And so I speculated that Faber Bank had been mislocated by Cook by 100 kilometers because Cook was exploring in the days before good time pieces. And so whether, well, it was possible to tell latitude by the stars, you had to estimate longitude based on time. And the clocks were so bad that it was easy to be off by 100 kilometers. So as we were going along uh, this track, I called up to the bridge and I said, and, and the, the bridge said, um, do you really want to go on this track because we're going to go over this thing favorite bank? I said, it's not there. You don't have to worry about it. So I said, OK, but um, all right. So, so I went, and of course, there was nothing there. All the ship's echo sounder showed nothing there. But then um, the next day, as we got further down on this line, I called up to the bridge, and I said, we're coming up to a major navigational hazard. I think this is really favorite bank. And the captain and the, the mate are going, well, there's nothing on our charts. We don't think there's anything here. But because they had trusted me that Faber Bank wasn't where it was supposed to be, just to be safe, they sent a uh, lookout up to the flying bridge of the ship. And we were, this was nighttime when we were going up on it. And I was watching the echo sounders in the lab, and I could see the seafloor starting to come up. And I'm sitting there, yep, this is it. And about 20 minutes later, I hear on the squawk box in the lab, breakers at 100 meters. <laughs> so because they had to the look up, up there and they were uh, had slowed down, we were able to avoid it. But it just shows that that uh, even doing remote sensing in the oceans uh, has its value. Uh, so, um, oh, so that's about Baker Bank, and the prediction was confirmed. Um, so now I'm going to talk about exploration in situ. So um, the, the first oceanographic expedition was the Challenger expedition in the 1800s. And um, the, uh, the idea was you would go out and you'd dredge the seafloor and bring samples back. You'd put water bottles over the side and analyze the water. You'd um, uh, do um, uh, net toes to get the animals. And of course, it was a very biased way to explore the ocean because the, um, uh, the rocks you get are only the rocks that are loose enough to get into your dredge. The animals you get are the only ones that survive. No one knew that there was this huge midwater community of gelatinous organisms because by the time the net toe was done, they were globs of goo and no one even knew what they were. And so um, uh, that meant that there was uh, a lot more that could be learned about the ocean by putting instruments in there and measuring the ocean in its existing state, not by bringing samples back. <laughs> so um, when I was at uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, we started developing um, autonomous underwater vehicles that could take instruments into the ocean to gather data, not samples, and bring back the data to tell us what the ocean was like in its ambient stage. So um, what I want to talk about is um, the, 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 uh, what we did there, which was the first attempt. This was work by Connor Jean to put artificial intelligence on an underwater vehicle. And so um, basically, uh, you see the vehicle here, and it's a large autonomous underwater vehicle. Autonomous means no tether and no connection to humans. You just have to let that device go, and uh, it does its mission. Now, before AI was introduced, what you would do is you would program it ahead of time. You would say, go for such a time, this direction, and then take a left and do this direction, and then take a right and come up to 30 meters and do it again or whatever. Everything had to be prescribed ahead of time and put into the little computer brain of the AUV and, and hope that you got something worthwhile. Well, by putting AI on it, we let the sensors tell the AUV what it should do and where it should go. 
So uh, this just shows um, the innards of it. Um, this uh, configuration it had some water sampling bottles. So we sent it out into Monterey Bay, and all we said was drive around until you find um, a uh, interesting phenomenon. At that point, we were looking at iron fertilization events in the ocean. Many of you know that, that iron fertilization is, the iron typically comes from land, and the iron actually causes plankton blooms, sometimes harmful plankton blooms. So we were looking for an iron fertilization of that. So we sent it out into Monterey Bay, and it just drove around until it detected iron above ambient levels. And then, by itself, it would drive through that plume of iron until the iron started tailing off, and it would come back and keep going back and forth, like mowing the lawn, until it had completely mapped out the volume of water where iron uh, had been enhanced. And then once it found the peak of that plume, drove back to the peak, opened its sampling bottles, collected the water for uh, later analysis to confirm the finding, and then came back to shore. And it did this all by itself. So what I sort of um, liken this to is having an AUV that's like a really smart Labrador retriever. You know, it knows that it has to find that duck that you shot. And so it goes out and it's sniffing back and forth, back and forth, it suddenly gets the scent, it's on the scent, it zooms in on it, gets it, and once it's found that duck, it goes to bring it home. And that's exactly what that AUV does. It's like a, uh, a uh, uh, underwater laboratory retrieval. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so, so that's uh, exploring in situ, where you actually have the instrument doing the work. There's also exploration in multiple scientific dimensions, because very often, to, to truly characterize what's going on in the ocean, you can't just focus on one discipline, just on the chemistry, or just on the biology. So there's also exploration in multiple dimensions. and. Um, so this is a story I love. It's from Bob Reinhardt at um, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute as well. And um, Bob found that um, he started looking at whales that had died uh, and gone to the seafloor in Monterey Bay. And when a whale dies, as I say here, it's seven to 15 tons of organic matter is suddenly deposited in what is otherwise a food desert. So the bottom of the ocean is a very tough place to make a living because there's not much to eat down there. And suddenly, manna from heaven, this dead whale comes down with all of this food to eat. So uh, what Bob started looking at was the variety of animals that would come in to feed off this feast. The first ones that come in are crabs and things like that that feed off the flesh. But the most interesting thing was the last phase, when there's only bones left. And um, when the bones were left, what uh, Brian Hood found was that the bone marrow was being consumed by these worms. They're about that high. They're tiny. They're about that high. Um, and the worms have these bile green roots, which um, drill into the bone and extract the bone marrow. And they have, these worms have no mouth and no digestive system. And they actually have symbiotic bacteria that lives in their roots that absorbs the nutrients and transfers it to the worms. So that was, that was a weird discovery to begin with, that these worms have no mouth, no gut, no digestive system, and yet they still survive thanks to these symbionts. But what was even more interesting about these worms is that they're all female. Every single worm was a female. And so, you know, everyone was scratching their heads, how can they all be women, you know, if they're feminists? <laughs> and so, um, the, uh, they um, started sending um, the worms um, out to, to look more carefully. And inside the worms, they found there were literally dozens 
of dwarf parasitic males. So the male species of the worm only got to be old enough that they could be incorporated into the bodies of the females to fertilize their offspring, but that was their only job. To fertilize the offspring as these dwarf parasites, they had no other function. So I, I asked Bob, uh, you know, I asked Bob, uh, is, is this a, a more primitive form of sexual reproduction, or is it a more advanced form? <laughs> and, and, and he, he seriously thought it was the way that the teacher was. <laughs> about these worms, other than their dwarf parasites, um, was the fact that we brought 300 different worms back to the lab. And the 300 different worms had 300 different mothers. And you figure out, how does this happen? This is this rare occurrence, this whale falling to the bottom of the ocean. And it didn't take but a matter of weeks for these 300 worms to attach to the stripped bones. And if they came from 300 different mothers, it doesn't mean that one worm you know, magically landed on this needle in a haystack and had lots of offspring that also fed on it. These all came from different mothers. So how did they find it? How did they possibly find this rare occurrence? So um, this is a mystery that we're still trying to solve by looking at things like chemical sensing. Is there a pheromone or something that comes off these whales that um, uh, draws um, the Ocidax to them and maybe they can go uh, months or years without feeding and then suddenly they, they get this banquet. Um, but you know, it led to the certain realization that we had to look at more than just the biology of these worms to figure out how they got there. Was it currents or, or something else? But one of the, so we would benefit from knowing, um, these are you know, two extreme cases, is there some sort of acute chemical sensing involved in bringing these 300 different worms to the same isolated whale hole? Or is the density of Ocidax larvae in the ocean so great that the ocean is literally raining Ocidax, and you just don't know it unless they find a whale fall. Well, one of the, um, uh, so let me, let me turn to the, the next topic as I go on with the study, and that is the ocean itself as a sensor. So we, we don't put equipment in the ocean, we let the ocean sense things for itself. So one of the ideas that I'm most um, excited about is the fact that the ocean is filled with microscopic biological sensors. You know, for example, I said when there's an iron um, injection, plankton bloom. So that is a way of using the ocean itself as a sensor and the plankton bloom as a proxy for iron. Um, but uh, the microscopic biological sensors are constantly sensing the ocean's physics, chemistry, and biology on a variety of scales at all times. They tend to concentrate in boundary layers where there are higher gradients of energy and food, so like at the bottom of the ocean or at um, the thermocline or, or at the surface. Um, and they have a range of mechanisms for sensing their environment and for communicating with each other. And I, I am convinced that basic research is going to give us opportunities to exploit these natural sensors for ocean situational awareness. And I think I've got one example here. Bacterial quorum sensing. The easiest way to, to think about this is um, all humans have you know, some bacteria that we've got in our systems at all times. But our immune system only kicks in when the bacteria get to a certain level that the um, immune system identifies it as an infection that has to be fought. And that's what we call cord sensing, where the body has an internal mechanism to understand, are these just a few isolated bacteria, or is it a whole bunch? Is there a quorum, and therefore we need to trigger some sort of way to fight it? 
And um, corn sensing is now being found basically in, in all systems where somehow bacteria know the difference, even though they're individual bacteria, they know the difference when they're on their own or when they're with the crowd. And so um, I, I think this uh, gives lots of opportunities for using the ocean itself as a biological sensor to understand changes in the ocean due to pollution, um, due to um, uh, even military applications when um, there are um, intrusions into the ocean from uh, sonar and submarines and things like that. So um, I think this is a, an exciting uh, possibility for the future. So um, here I've got a couple of suggestions, like devising a method to turn off quorum sensing mechanisms in order to allow ocean operations to continue undetected in the marine environment. We might actually want to turn the quorum sensing off. Or find other systems that use quorum sensing and produce some easily observed gene expression uh, of that. And then enhance the threshold for the quorum response to allow for broader ranges of detection. All of these, I think, are exciting for the future. So um, I'm going to end there because I know that this is a lunchtime talk and I'm supposed to talk quickly and shut up. But uh, if there's any 